Good morning. Thanks for coming up here. So, when people go on a safari, do you know what a safari is? When you go see wild animals like lions and elephants and, you know, lions, elephants, and rhinos, like anything out in the long, you want to be a long ways away from, right? You really want to bring your binoculars. Can, I, can you guys show me your binoculars? Thank you. And binoculars help you see things that are far away, things that you might not have noticed. And we all know, we all know that God is with us, right? We know God's with us. We hear that all the time. But does it seem like you can see God? No? Do you, can you think of where you might have seen God in your life, in your day? It's kind of tricky to think about that, isn't it? So at Vacation Bible School this summer, you might come to United's Vacation Bible School, and it's in June, so tell mom and dad that you really want to come. You're going to learn about a thing called God sightings, ways that you have seen God, that you can focus on seeing God. And if you learn to look like you learn to look through some binoculars, you might see evidence that God is with you and be reminded that God is good. So let me help you out with a few examples. So when you go to VBS this summer, you might know and be able to answer when someone asks you if you've had a God sighting. So an example would be a hug, right, from someone you love. It might be seeing an amazing sunset or a kind word from a friend. Or maybe it's feeling the soft, su fuzzy fur of your favorite kitty or a cool drink of lemonade on a hot day. And next time you see, you think you see a God sighting, maybe you can tell your mom or your dad or your grandma or grandpa that you have seen it. And so one, um, one thing you could say was, wow, mom, God gave you such a beautiful smile. I see God's joy in you. You're a God sighting. So you can put that one in your back pocket because that's a good one. Okay, how about this? When your sister colors you a picture, you can say, wow, God gave you the gift of creativity. I see how awesome God is when I see what you do. You are a God sighting to me. Okay, now everybody put your binoculars on. Look out there. Do you see God out there? Anybody? <laughs> do you see God out there? Yeah. I see some beautiful quilts. Is that a God sighting? What's God up to in those quilts? Hmm. We're going to find that out later in worship. I see some really smiling faces. Maybe I see God in those faces. So let's stay on the lookout for seeing God everywhere we go. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for helping us see you. We thank you and love you. Amen. All right. So put your binoculars on. Make sure you find God out there. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Okay. Please rise for the gospel acclamation. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 13th chapter. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. 
If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little while longer. You will see, you will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. Father Gregory Boyle is the founder of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles, California, also known as the gang capital of the world. In his book, Tattoos on the Heart, Father Greg writes about Looney. And I'm going to tell you one of his stories. Looney is a 15-year-old from a gang located close to our office. He is a chaparrito, barely reaches my chest, and he has just been disgorged from one of the 24 probation camps in L.A. County. Michelle and Emily, the office workers, have taken up it upon themselves to kill the fatted pepperoni and welcome home the prodigal loony. When five extremely large pizzas come, they hand me the bill, which I don't seem to recall from the gospel account. We cram ourselves onto the tiny couch in the even sparser reception area and eat our pizza. All the office staff join in. Looney is luminous and giddy in his awkwardness eyes darting to all of us gathered around, trying to measure our delight in his return. He can barely believe it's so high. I'm sitting on the arm of the couch eating my slice and Looney leans into me with a whisper. Can I talk to you, G, alone in your office? I gather my grub and sit behind my desk. He moves to a chair situated too far for his liking and presses it very close to the front of my desk. He extricates a long envelope squished in his side pocket and proudly slaps it in front of me on my desk. My grades, he announces, from camp. Straight A's, he says. Like a kid fumbling with wrap, unwrapping a present, I get the transcript out and extend it open. And sure enough, right there before my eyes, two C's, two B's, one A. And I think, close enough, not the straightest A's I've ever seen. I decide not to tell Looney he's an unreliable reporter here. Wow, mijo, I tell him, nice going. I carefully refold the transcript and put it back in the envelope. On everything I love, mijo. I say to him, if you were my son, I'd be the proudest man alive. In a flash, Looney situates his thumb and his first finger in, the eye, in his eye sockets, trembling and wanting to stem the flow of tears, which seem inevitable at this point. Like a kid with fingers in the dike, he's shaking now and desperate not to cry. I look at this little guy and know that he has been returned to a situation largely unchanged. Parents are either absent at any given time or plagued by mental illness. Chaos and dysfunction is what will now surround him as before. His grandmother, a good woman, whose task it is now to raise this kid, is not quite up to the task. I know that one month before this moment, I buried Looney's best friend, killed in our streets for no reason at all. So I lead with my gut. I bet you're afraid to be out, aren't you? This seems to push the play button on Looney's tear ducts, and quickly he folds his arms on the front of my desk and rests his sobbing head on his folded arms. I let him cry it out. Finally, I reach across the desk and I place my hand on his shoulder. You're going to be okay. Looney sits up with what is almost defiance and tends to the wiping of his tears. I 
just want to have a life. I'm taken aback by the determination with which he says this. Well, Miho, I say to him, who told you that you couldn't have one? I mean, remember the letters you used to write to me from camp, telling me about all the gifts and goodness you discovered in yourself? Stuff you didn't know was there? Look, dog, I know you think you're in a deep, dark hole, but you're in a tunnel. It's the nature of tunnels that if you just keep walking, the light's gonna show up. Trust me, I can see it. I'm taller than you are. Looney sniffles and nods and seems to listen. You're gonna be just fine, after all. And I hand him back his grades, straight A's. Father Greg wraps up this story, saying, A sinner, an outcast. This was a social grouping of people who felt completely unacceptable. The world had deemed them disgraceful and shameful, and this toxic shame was brought inside and given a home in the outcast. Jesus' strategy is a simple one. He eats with them. Precisely to those paralyzed in this toxic shame, Jesus says, I will eat with you. He goes where love has not yet arrived, and he gets his grub on. Eating with outcasts rendered them acceptable. Pizzas all around, Looney's home, recognizing that we are completely acceptable in God's own truth for us waiting to be discovered. There's a ton of amazing stories in this book and I highly recommend it. Stories about compassion and forgiveness and redemption. He truly tells the gospel in very creative ways. Our reading from Acts ties in with this, I think. It takes us to the earliest days of the church these Jews, now followers of Jesus, are trying to figure out what it means to practice believing, what it means to invite others into following the risen Christ. Peter wasn't supposed to be at the dinner table with those people. He wasn't supposed to be eating their food. The wrong food, the wrong people. The Gentiles are still the outsiders. They are still the ones not accepted. And in a radical decision, Peter eats with the outcasts. He not only eats with them, but he proclaims that this was God's work at hand and exclaims, who was I that I could hinder God? Peter has learned from Jesus that sharing food matters. He has learned that eating with the outcasts, newfound friends, has the power to reveal the work of God. The risen Christ shows us that love shows up in unlikely places, often around tables with food, conversations, and open hearts. Maybe the ones most different than us. The ones who think different, or their social status, their political alignment, even their skin color, sexual orientation, culture, or religion are different than ours. Sharing a meal and a conversation with people who are different than us can not only change their lives, like the ones in this story, who become followers of Jesus. But more importantly, our lives can be changed too. This radical move to eat with the outcasts changed the mission of the followers of Jesus to include God's repentance that leads to life for all people. Jews and Gentiles, outcasts and friends. And this, my friends, is good news. God makes it abruptly clear to Peter and to us that there are no longer categories that separate us and divide us. 
but that God will always draw all things together and God will make all things new. What does this look like in the real world? Does it mean sitting with a lone kid at the cafeteria table at lunch? Does it mean inviting a stranger to coffee hour after church? Perhaps it means sitting with kids and eating with them at the summer lunch program in the courtyard. Because Peter preaches, the Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. What would it mean for you also, all of us, to look with our binoculars, to find the places where we might see God at work in our midst, maybe around a table with food, Maybe you've seen God at work in the midst of sharing coffee with a friend whose marriage is torn apart. Maybe you've witnessed God at work at the mission while eating food with strangers. Or you might even see God in a kid like Looney. By practicing and finding God around us, we disciples, we can really know that God is indeed with us and at work. God is breaking down barriers and God is drawing all people together. Dear followers of Jesus, take Peter's lead and look for God at work. And then go share this good news with everyone you meet. Amen.